Hello. Welcome everyone. I'm Deborah Diamond, Curator of South and Southeast Asian Art at the Fuhrer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. And I am delighted to welcome you today to our new lunchtime series called Sneak Peek, New Research from the Fuhrer and Sackler. Our inaugural program today is called Tropical Temples of South and Southeast Asia, Water and Sacred Environments, presented by curator Emma Natalia Stein. Her talk will explore Hindu and Buddhist temples in India and Indonesia and, and look at their relationships to the local environment. Dr. Stein joined the Fira Sackler as a curatorial fellow for Southeast Asian art after completing her PhD in the history of art at Yale University in 2017. And then she joined the curatorial staff a year later in 2019. Her research centers on the relationship between sacred architecture and tropical landscapes in pre-modern South and Southeast Asia, with an emphasis on mapping sacred and urban spaces. Her exhibitions include Power and Southeast Asia and When We Reopen, Prehistoric Spirals, Earthenwares from Thailand. Emma wears many hats. She's also created a robust online resource for Southeast Asia that connects objects in the Fira and Sackler collections with the landscapes and cultures from which they originate. And we'll put the link to that in our chat. The website features an interactive map of sacred sites based on her years of fieldwork in Indonesia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, India, and Sri Lanka. And it's iterative, so it grows um, each year. Emma also frequently presents aspects of her research and the museum collections at talks at institutions and universities in Asia, Europe, and the United States. Emma, thank you very much for speaking today, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Deborah. Let me share my screen. Okay. I'm delighted to be opening this series today. Since we're all stuck in this extended period of no travel, what I'd like to do is take you on a virtual tour to places where I've done field work in recent years. In this 20 minute talk, we're going to travel first to Southern India and then to Indonesia to explore their spectacular Hindu and Buddhist temples. We'll look specifically at the temple's relationships to the environment and to their local landscapes. I'm going to take us to quite a few different places and I don't want you to worry too much about the specific names or precise locations. Just let them kind of wash over you and focus on the larger themes and the points of comparisons. We'll begin in a city, but then we'll venture into the jungle where cave temples and other types of sacred sites are built on the banks of steep river ravines. Just about a year ago, right before the onset of the pandemic, amazingly, I was fortunate enough to visit South India for fieldwork. I went back to my Indian hometown, so to speak, the city of Kanchi in Tamil Nadu. This is the place where I did my doctoral research and it's the subject of my forthcoming book titled Infinite Temples, Constructing the City of, of Kanchi, South India. Kanchi is a bustling little city, popularly known as the city of 1,000 temples. Its most active temple is dedicated to Kamakshi, the city's goddess. This is a large complex that has been built up over the course of many centuries. This temple likely began as a loose cluster of shrines for Buddhist and Jain deities that were unified into a Hindu temple complex around the middle of the 14th century. Kanchi also has several archeologically preserved monuments. The most widely known is the Kailasanatha temple dedicated to Shiva. It was built during the first quarter of the eighth century. Notice that there are no people here. It's totally open to the public, but as an officially protected monument, it's just not a major place of active devotion anymore. Nevertheless, the occasional foreign visitor to Kanchi would certainly have it on their itinerary because of the beautiful sculptures that cover every surface of the walls. At Kailasanatha today, you can see the brown color of the sandstone and the intricacy of carving, but the walls were originally also painted in vibrant colors. 
The paintings were preserved in parts of the temple that are sheltered from the ravages of the seasonal monsoon rains. The other temples in the city retain much more of their original character than the Kailasanatha does. To return to the Kamakshi temple, the temple of the city goddess, there are often large scale rituals that take place. This was a 10 day festival that I had the good fortune to attend in 2014. In order to please the goddess, priests made a fire pit and threw in sacred offerings ranging from fruits and flowers to silk saris. They continuously recited mantras or prayers in the ancient language of Sanskrit. The festival was sponsored by a family who had come from hundreds of miles away to perform this ceremony at this particular temple. That was a very special occasion, but even on a regular day, the Kamakshi temple is a destination place, both for local residents and for visitors to the city. Temples in India function as community spaces where families come and enjoy the evening. You can get a sense of the flavor of the place just by listening. So here's a 30 second audio recording of what it sounds like at this temple on an ordinary day. Maybe a little bit faint, it's kind of an ambient sound. So you heard people calling to each other, children running around, the sounds of horns honking just outside the complex. It's a place where just daily life can take place and people can come and enjoy some of the only open air spaces in the city. Now you may have noticed that there's a large water feature that is part of the temple complex. It's an ablutions tank or pool called Kolam in Tamil a place where devotees and priests can take a ritual dip before entering the temple's interior. Water is a very important part of ritual and Hindu temples always contain some kind of a tank or a pond as part of their property. Now some temples are built right on the banks of rivers so that water could be made easily available. Here's a temple about 15 miles east of Kanchi that stands at the confluence of three rivers. Now, you may have noticed that the riverbed is completely dry, no water at all. Today in Tamil Nadu, the rivers have dried up as a result of climate change, the construction of artificial dams, deforestation, and illegal sand mining activity. The sand is used for making concrete. But in the past, when the water was flowing regularly, this temple landscape may have looked a lot more tropical. Something more like this. The difference between water and no water is enormous in the tropical monsoon climate of Southern India and Southeast Asia. To show you just one example, look at the cave site of Elephanta Island off the coast of Mumbai before and transforms. So we can use information from other times of year or even other places to help us reimagine what a particular site looked like in the past, either when water was present or when ritual activity was abundant. In my research, I find that comparisons between India and Southeast Asia are particularly informative. Indian and Southeast Asian temples share many important features one is that they are positioned in relation to the landscape, things like mountains and water bodies. But in Southeast Asia, the connection is even more apparent than it is in India. So let us travel farther east and farther south now and spend the rest of our time exploring places in Indonesia where the rivers still flow and the importance of water for ritual can readily be seen even in the archeologically preserved monuments that are no longer in devotional use. 
Indonesia's main Hindu and Buddhist temples are located on the islands of Java and Bali. Some are in areas that formerly were great cities. Others are immersed in the jungle. The most widely known monuments are Prambanan and Borobudur. They draw visitors from all over the world. Prambanan was a city of 1,000 temples, just like Kanchi was. It was a royal capital and a multi-religious place. There are Hindu and Buddhist temples. And it flourished at the very same time as Kanchi, roughly during the 8th through the 13th centuries. Like the Kailasanatha temple in Kanchi, today both Prambanan and Barobador have become archaeological moment, monuments, frozen in a particular vision of their existence. They're now surrounded by gardened causeways, paved paths, and manicured lawns. At the two Javanese sites, the temples are accessed through ticketed entryways that force the tourists to meander through a labyrinth of shops and sweet smelling food stalls before reaching the temples. In this case, we can think back to a temple like Kamakshi in Kanchi, where ritual is still vibrant, and we can use that picture to help us reimagine what Prambanan looked like when the temples were active and the city was alive. So look here and think about the colors of that ritual we just talked about and hear the sounds of chanting to the goddess and imagine this place just as flooded with people and action. Now, one reason why Barobador and Prambanan have become protected monuments is that like the Kailasanatha temple in Kanchi, their walls are covered in beautiful relief carvings. Although we can't see active rituals taking place there now, the reliefs themselves supply important information. They begin to give us a sense of the types of people who used the temples and lived in the surrounding city. In this image, we see a temple priest sprinkling holy water over the head of the Tubi king. The priest's matted beard and large earrings tell us he is an ascetic, as does the type of water vessel that he holds. The pot is called a kundaga, and it's in fact an Indian form that was transmitted to Indonesia along with other portable wares that circulated through networks of maritime trade. Remember the importance of water in ritual. Here we see water being used to seal blessings and confer royal status. Ritual water vessels don't only appear in reliefs. Examples survive from pre-modern Indonesia and must have been used in temple contexts like Prambanan. This vessel on loan to our museum takes the shape of a naga or serpent deity. The naga is another image and concept that was transmitted from India and fit perfectly in the tropical landscape of Indonesia. The naga is a particularly auspicious symbol throughout Southeast Asia, where serpents are believed to guard the cosmic oceans and to provide a bridge between earthly and transcendent spaces. Similarly connected with water, one of the most important deities in Java is Agastya, the divine sage. His key attribute is the kundaka water pot, which he holds here in his left hand. We have a ceramic kundaka from Cambodia in the Sackler collection that shows you the shape of the pot a little more clearly and the way it was adapted in metal, stone, and ceramic. But water was probably used even more elaborately at Prambanan. Look at the bottom of the staircases to the individual shrines. Look at how the lowest step ends way above the ground. And look at the fanciful animals that function as banisters. These are makaras, mythical sea creatures that are something like a cross between a crocodile and a dragon. Like nagas, they're protective spirits that live in the water. Now, this is really great. It's possible that for ritual purposes, the entire grounds of the Shiva complex at Prambanan were flooded with water and bridges made of bamboo were set up between the shrines. Archeologists have recently discovered irrigation channels that led into the complex and could have controlled the influx and drainage of water. Can you imagine this? The shrines would have reflected in the water and looked like islands floating on the cosmic ocean of bliss. Prambanan today is a UNESCO protected monument. Ritual doesn't take place there and the complex certainly doesn't get flooded with water anymore. However, 
There are plenty of places in both Java and Bali where water is still a part of the life of the sacred site. At Gunung Kawi, Gunung means volcano, so that tells you something about the site right away. At Gunung Kawi, massive caves and shrines are cut into the living rock on both sides of a rushing river. It's an immersive space that fully surrounds you. Close to the rock-cut shrines, water pours from fountains that take advantage of the flow down the slope of the mountain that the site is built into. The whole cistern beneath the shrines fills with water during monsoon, and you can see the ancient fountain heads that help to fill it below each one. The farthest one is still flowing. I've circled it a little bit larger for you. Now think back to Prambanan and how the grounds may have been flooded sometimes with the shrines rising from the water. The way the water runs through the site at Gonangkawi mirrors ancient agricultural practices of terraced rice fields in Bali. By the way, Gonangkawi is one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been. For this picture, we're standing right outside of the sacred area. The shrines I just, told, I just showed you are basically over here to the lower left of the image. Gunungkawi is a rice field covered mountain slope. You can see the way the water collects in each terrace and then filters down to the next, making use of gravity to fertilize the land. All throughout Bali, we see this perfect harmony of sacred space and agriculture it's especially apparent in Bali's numerous sacred bathing places called tirtas. At one of these tirtas, Pura Menjening, water moves from the upper to lower pools through the same kinds of systems as it does at Gunungkawi. At Pura Menjening, the high ground is considered the purest area. So a temple stands at the top and devotees can bathe only at the bottom after the water has flowed through the full elevation of the site. In keeping with this, mountains in Indonesia are also holy places. Temples mimic the shape of mountains and temples are built in relation to mountains, which are volcanoes. Here, we're standing right at the center of a temple in a very remote village in Eastern Bali. We're looking through the temple's split gate, a characteristic feature of Balinese architecture across a crater lake towards the volcanic mountain. Notice that the split gate structure is directly aligned with the peak of the volcano. Architecture and nature meet again. Back in central Java, not far from Prambanan is Borobudur, Indonesia's most famous monument. This is the most popular tourist destination in Java where visitors go to watch the sunrise with the smoking volcano of Merapi visible in the distance. Barobador's walls are even more extensively covered in relief carvings than any of the other temples we've explored today. A full visit to the site requires a more than six mile walk around five terraces, each of which is lined with narrative imagery. It's hard to get a sense of the space through a single photograph with the circuitous layout and the way the reliefs fully surround you. So I'm showing you a picture of me doing field work to give you a sense of scale and of how hard it is to photograph. These reliefs tell stories that range from the Buddha's previous lives to the road to our own enlightenment. In between, they show Indonesia's local life and the spaces where ritual could be enacted. In one of these relief panels, we see a recurrent theme in Indonesian art ascetics in a jungle hermitage. Notice their dreadlocks piled into high coiffures, their pointed beards, and the emaciated rib cage of the ascetic in the center. At the right is a supplicant who has come to learn from these ritual specialists. Images like this become all the more powerful when we plunge back into the jungle to discover that there are many, many sites along the riverbanks that looks similar to what we see in the relief, but colorful and sonorous. At the 15th century site of Ye Palu, we see an image of an ascetic woman in a cave with a male ascetic seated at left. Notice his dreadlocks piled into a kind of beehive hairdo that by this point in time 
has become a typical indicator of asceticism in Indonesian art. Just steps beyond the relief are two excavated caves that look just like the site being illustrated. At Belahan, high on a remote jungle-covered mountain in East Java, we find a merging of water, nature, and asceticism. Here is a man with that beehive hairdo again, carved into the brick, nearly flying over a bathing pool that is fed by fountains in the form of goddesses. And at Nawongo, also in East Java, a relief carving can barely be detected through the layers of lush jungle foliage. Give your eyes a moment to adjust to it, and then you'll see the rows of swirling geometric ornamentation that is carved into the rock across the, riv across the ravine. Now, Wongo is a much more extensive site that includes sculpted bathing pools, fountains, and divine imagery that is only beginning to be explored by local archaeologists. Natural imagery finds its way into portable objects, not just relief carvings. A painting in the Sackler collection shows a woman making offerings to a deity, possibly the rice goddess Devi Shri, beneath a tree on the banks of a river. This scene could take place at any one of the jungle hermitages we looked at today. Similarly, Indonesia's rich plant life inspires patterns in textiles, such as this 18th century example at the Yale University Art Gallery. We've seen that even in the urban temples, the jungle continues to thrive. So we've come a long way from that temple town in Tamil Nadu where we began. But perhaps after this foray into Java and Bali's tropical temples, you'll be able to see how this temple was once alive and this river once flowed. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for that superb and thought-provoking talk, illustrated with many fantastic pictures, photographs you took yourself from your archives. Just wanna give you a shout out for that. Um, you know, I was really struck by how fruitful your methodology is in combining rigorous scholarship, you, you know, intensive looking, but also really foregrounding the role of imagination, inviting us to imagine, I guess, lost ecologies or environmental contexts in India, or the lost sound smells and rituals of protected environments, architectural sites in um, Indonesia. And I was wondering, I will ask questions for everyone, but if I could just begin with one question of my own, which was um, when we have you know, a temple, a, a living temple today in India, and there's no longer running water, the river is dry, does that impact you know, either the rituals that take place or the popularity of the temple? Or is it a question of sort of like a different mood or ambiance? It's such a good question. Um, yes, I have found, um, at least in Tamil Nadu, in, in Northern Tamil Nadu, in the region around Kanchi, that um, there's this kind of tracery of dry rivers that you know, crisscross um, the landscape. And there are temples that are built, you know, these are, these are um, prosperous stone temples. They were expensive to build. They were built between the 9th and the 13th centuries, most of them and they sort of plot out the course or the former course of the river. It shows that these places were once prominent because they had the resources to sponsor um, an elite temple construction, but the villages that surround them have really deteriorated. Um, they're very small, they're sparsely populated. Um, there's a, there's a, a kind of correlation between the drying of the rivers and the disappearance of places that previously thrived. And that translates to the temples as well. You know, there are these big stone temples where very minimal ritual takes place. So there's certainly um, a correspondence between the presence of water and the amount of active ritual that can take place in the site. To follow up on that, a question from Lynn Jordan, which has given the impacts of natural erosion over time, as well as air and water pollution and climate change and vandalism, um, are the sites being documented so that they can be preserved virtually for future study? Mm. To which I would add, is anyone documenting the sites in their environmental context like you are? 
There are efforts in, in Indonesia. Um, the local archaeology departments are really active there, and um, there's great work being done, um, less so locally in Tamil Nadu. Um, but in Indonesia, there, there is a good amount of sort of just local effort, whether it's coming from an archaeology department in a university or under the Ministry of Culture, or it's just local people who are taking pride in the ruins, like in the jungle, Nawongo, that last site that I showed you. Um, there's just sort of somebody there who is attending the site um, and making sure that it stays safe to the best of his ability. Lisa Socket asks, regarding the possible flooding of the Indonesian temple complex, I guess it was Prambanam. Mm -hmm. um, she asks, are there any written works documenting anything like that? Or what is that um, sort of supposition based on? Um, so it's mostly based on archeological studies and actually looking at the structure of the complex and doing the kinds of comparisons that I showed you today. Um, with a site like Gonangkawi, where we really see the way that water still is manipulated through the site. Um, but there's a, there's a book called In Praise of Prampanan by the scholar Roy Jordan. It's quite an old book. Um, he was one of the foundational um, scholars for Indonesian um, temple studies. Uh, and he was actually the first one to postulate this. So this is, you know, we're going back decades and decades of scholarship and sort of, it wasn't taken very seriously, but now with more recent archeological excavations that are happening around the temple, finding these irrigation channels that show that it actually was possible to maneuver water into the, into the site. Um, we don't need a textual description. We can just look at it, you know, in order to be able to understand it. How extraordinary that would have been with the reflections of the temples and the different sounds of the water coming out of the Makura's mouth. And thank you very much for using sound as well um, in your talk and in, in, you know, working to give us a sense of, you know, the sound, the, the multi-sensorial texture of temple sites. I have a question, the first one I think we got from Michael McDonald. We, and he was asking whether there are any direct connections between the artisans who sculpted temples in Indonesia and Angkor, or for that matter, between Indonesia and India. And, and, uh, yeah, I can answer specifically between Indonesia and India. There were artisans from Gujarat who were brought um, to work on Chandi Plausan, which is part of the Prambanan complex. Um, Indonesia and Angkor, I have to say, I doubt it. Um, they were both using similar sources of Indian temple architecture and inviting ritual specialists, architects, designers from India to advise on, um, on building these large temple complexes in Southeast Asia. We have very specific instances of um, Brahmin priests from India going to Cambodia and helping to make temples. Um, and again, you know, coming from India to Indonesia. There circulation more broadly between mainland and island, and island Southeast Asia, but whether or not they, if they were sharing artisans, I, I just sort of doubt it because there was enough local talent on the ground in each place. Mm -hmm. I'd love the stone to might be very it. different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I the totally carving would be different because in, um, in Indonesia, the stone is volcanic, it's andesite. Um, which is formed when lava from the island's many volcanoes, some of which I showed you today, cools and hardens. Um, but in Cambodia, the local stone is sandstone, which is much softer, it's much more workable, it's easier to carve, and it lends itself to a very different style um, and aesthetic of, of, um, of creation than andesite does. You're so fluent in, in both um, South Asia and Southeast Asian architecture. So I'm just gonna whip you back to um, India for a minute. Because we have two questions from uh, Susan Bean that are basically, she's asking, can you tell us anything about the use of color at Kanchi or, or maybe particularly on the temple exterior at Kanchi? Uh, yeah, um, so there are a few temples in which um, 
paintings from the Pallava period survive. So there's there's the fragments of paintings at the Kailasanatha temple in Kanchi, and then there's um, the Talagiri Spira temple in Panamalai, which is farther south in Tamil Nadu and has extraordinary paintings, very similar of, um, you know, of goddesses and members of sort of the celestial court. Um, there haven't been any actual studies on the pigment, you know, um, pigment analysis. Um, there's, one article that discusses conservation of um, of the Kailasanatha temple's paintings, but I think it would be a great topic for you know for somebody to explore further. But the I, I very much believe that the paintings do date to the same time period as the temple's construction. Um, the style of the deities and the imagery is very similar to what we see in the sculpted um, in the sculpted panels. Um, but there's certainly a continuation of earlier traditions of Indian painting that we see, you know, in the Western Deccan and also as far afield as in Sri Lanka at Sigiriya. Um, there's a kind of unified regional style that transforms over the course of several centuries. Christina Lanpurpur, um, thank you for an illuminating discussion and ask a very interesting question. Um, given the importance of water in these temples, are rainy times of the year, I and mean, particularly the monsoon season, were they, was that also a time of particular ritual or, or greater festivities at these temples? Mm -hmm. Yes, it often is. And um, something I found really uh, illuminating was to be in Kanchi through two seasonal cycles, because um, I, I was very fortunate to have two years of, um, of field work uh, where I spent a lot of time there and going back to the same temples throughout the year and seeing the way that festivals changed and responded to what was happening seasonally. Um, of course, Navaratri and Dashara happens all over India um, in September time. Um, but that's, that's a time of kind of renewal and um, multi-day celebrations at all of the temples that involve flowers and food offerings, and then also music in the temples. Um, as far as a fest, I'm trying to think of a festival specifically connected with the rains. Um, in Kanchipuram, I can't think of anything offhand, but, um, but certainly there's a, there's a different kind of spirit during, um, during the monsoon versus during the dry season. I'll just skip for now to um, a question from Kay Stiegler, which is, um, it seems to me that there are a lot of temples on Bali considering the size of it. Mm -hmm. And is this true? And if so, why is that the case? Mm, that's such a great question. Yes, there are so many temples in Bali. And um, one thing I have been very fascinated by there is the way that there, there are these discrete kind of monuments that are known, like if you visit Bali, you'll probably go to the town of Ubud, um, where many sacred sites um, are, are located either in the town or around it. And there's a place called Goa Gaja, which is one of the most popular tourist destinations. It's very, very beautiful. You can park in you know, a paved parking lot and go in and see this one big cave with a really remarkable carving on, on its um, face. But then if you just walk back into the jungle, <laughs> there's a pathway that continues and there's shrine after shrine after shrine, um, all the way to Ye Palu, which is the next kind of you know, known site on the, on the tourist trail. Um, so what I've found in Bali is that as soon as you start looking for the boundaries of a sacred site, you run into the next one. They kind of lead together. Um, and create this, this network of sacred spaces, many of which run along rivers. Um, there's definitely connection there. And then others are built on, um, on the slopes of, of volcanoes, which are sacred mountains. I'm gonna try and group together questions because now we have a lot coming in all at once. Um, so if you could perhaps, um, here are some related to India. I mean, one is if you could talk a bit about the reasons why the river courses in Tamil Nadu have changed or diminished over time. 
And the other is when you first, from Charlotte, Grant, when you first began um, your fantastic study on lost ecologies, where did you turn, like, how did you first use the archives to reimagine Kanchi? What evidence helped you to begin to understand um, why the river or why any of the rivers really in Tamil Nadu were no longer flowing? Was it orientation of temples, you know, towards non-existent rivers? Was it archival manuscripts, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the rivers have dried up for a variety of reasons and I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a scientist. I, <laughs> um, I don't have the answers, but, um, but I work a lot with satellite imagery. That's um, that Google Earth is my main tool, and I do a lot of mapping. I didn't really talk about that today, but um, but a big part of my field process is um, and documentation process, besides photographing, is plotting the GPS points of sacred sites. And so I have extensive maps um, from uh, that I've created for South India and also for um, these larger temple sites in Southeast Asia, like Angkor and Prambanan. Um, and so dry rivers are very visible in satellite imagery. You can see this kind of brown vein that crosses an otherwise green space of rice fields and lakes and so forth. Um, and so I began to be curious about that. And if you follow many of the rivers from Tamil Nadu north towards their beginnings in higher grounds, you encounter dams. And so there are artificial dams that have been built mostly in, um, you know, in regions farther north. Um, the one that kind of <laughs> chokes out the river that would run through Kanchi is um, a, a large dam in Andhra Pradesh. Um, and you can absolutely see in the satellite imagery, the way the water is present in the Northern part of the river and then it hits the dam and it's, it, it just strangles it right there. So um, some of it is because of you know, more contemporary construction like, like dams. Some of it is because of deforestation and climate change. Um, and some of it again is because of um, illegal sand mining activity um, where the sand from the riverbed is, is collected in these large lorries and taken to make concrete um, throughout India and that disrupts the whole natural ecology of the, of the riverbed. Um, I love, okay. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, just to I say, I really loved, because I, I think all the questions will kind of tie together in a moment, I promise. But I really loved in the talk, the way that you took, you know, these isolated, beautiful museum objects that we have and like slowly began to like build their backstories and help us imagine that. And I wanted to um, expand on that through a question that came from Tamara Sears, who thanks you for a wonderful talk and writes, you gave us a glimpse of how thinking through landscape can provide new insight onto iconographic details. I was wondering if you might expand on this idea. Are there particular ways in which thinking through environmental history can shift the interpretation of visual programs or to what extent do visual programs provide insight into environmental histories? Hmm. And have you, again, um, she also mentions if you've thought about connections between seasonality and narratives and localized environmental conditions. Mm, yes, oh, fabulous questions. Um, yes, I think pick one, pick one in the interest yeah. of time, perhaps. Well, um, I think that in terms of the way that looking at environments can change what we see in something like a single panel of a relief carving or a single object, is it sort of shifts the focus because to, in traditional art historical studies, there's um, the attention tends to go to what the which god is represented, what it's you know what it's holding, what the iconography is of a deity. Um, so if we think of if we think of Shiva um, as Dakshinamurti, who's the divine teacher, there's a beautiful tableau of Shiva um, on the Kailasana at the temple that's very famous um, for a Tamil image. Um, and Shiva, you know, is described as okay, he's the sacred teacher, and he's sitting with his legs crossed and a sort of yogic strap holding his position together, and he's under a bunyan tree. And that's as far as the description would go in a traditional study. He's surrounded by animals. He's in a forest hermitage. He's in an, a kind of ashram scene. Um, and so if we start to think beyond just the image, um, we can see these broader landscapes that are depicted along with the gods. Um, I think very much so in 
Southeast Asia, we see the local landscape there in the narratives of Borobudur, even though um, there's a lot of circulation of ideas and imagery between India and Southeast Asia, what we see is a much mo more localized version of the plants, of the animals, um, of the life, you know, of local life of villages, of cities um, that correspond to what, um, to what was actually around the artists at the time that they created. There's so much more to say about that. I know, I know. And there's so many good questions and there's quite an interesting discussion going on in the, in the question uh, area um, about different texts that I'll save those for you for another time because it doesn't really make sense to go in those directions. But there was one question that I really love, although I know the answer, um, comes from Lynn Jordan. And it's, how did Emma get interested in this area of study and what are you working on next? <laughs> well, Deborah, <laughs> uh, I got interested in um, Indian temples when I was an undergrad at Columbia. Um, I had the good fortune my freshman year to take an intro to art history class at which there was a guest lecture <laughs> by Deborah Diamond <laughs> on South Asian art. And um, I remember seeing the great temple of Tanjavur, which is a Tamil temple um, built in 1010 CE and being absolutely floored by just the intricacy of all these levels and all these architectural details. Um, and that never left my mind. Um, it took a long time before I was actually back to um, really delving into um, Indian temple architecture. Um, but then I did my PhD at Yale um, with Tamara Sears. Uh, and always through that process was looking not only at um, India, but also comparatively to Southeast Asia. And during my field work in India, I traveled as much as possible to Southeast Asia um, to begin to um, map these larger patterns in urban planning between South and Southeast Asian temple cities um, of the sort of roughly eighth through 13th centuries. What I'm working on now is, um, I, I would say my, my big challenge is how to bring this kind of fieldwork centric approach into the galleries um, as a curator. And so um, I'm working on exhibitions that contextualize sculpture um, and textiles and, um, and paintings and other types of material of media um, within, uh, within the kinds of environments that they would have been. Um, it's a challenge. And it's something that um, I'm working with Deborah on in an exhibition of paintings from Royal Udaipur, um, where we're looking at paintings that have traditionally been described as portraits of kings um, and recontextualizing them as, as landscapes. Um, and I'm also working on an exhibition of a Cambodian sculpture um, that places it back in its original site location um, through virtual features um, and celebrates the kind of mastery of this particular sculpture, but in a larger, um, in, a, in a larger context of landscape. And we're very much looking forward to like the forthcoming publication of your book. I'm hoping that's coming sometime later this fall. Later this year. And do an event then, and I'll save these questions, some of these questions um, for that kind of book talk. Um, this was a, a, a great talk and um, I'm really thank you very much for inaugurating our series um, in this way. And I encourage everyone not only to come back next, um, well, before, before we end this, I just wanna say, Emma, um, thank you very much. Your way of looking at uh, landscape, the environment and its impact on place and iconography and your skills in mapping have transformed the way that we understand um, Udaipur court painting, as well as the ways we understand the connections between South and Southeast Asia. And we'll pick this up um, when your book is published shortly. So um, everyone who's come today, we'll invite you back to hear Emma again. But um, you can find more information on our next talks, you know, on our website, 
asia.si.edu slash events. And any additional questions and comments can be directed to our scholarly programs and publication department uh, by emailing the address that you see there. Everybody, thank you very, very much. These are complicated and difficult times, um, but this was a, a wonderful um, place to go sort of intellectually, emotionally, and sensorially today. So thank you for joining us. Um, stay safe and stay well and see you next month.